glory and honor, power and majesty be ascribed to the Lord our God. You are welcome to this edition. Um, discussions with some persons have brought to light the feelings among some of the Lord's people that um, there seem to be a discrimination and it seemed to be a holier than thou attitude and that uh, why should some be taught as uh, meriting a special treatment from Jesus Christ in being um, given a place by the throne on, on the throne when we are all saved by grace what what qualifies this person is that excludes others why say that there's a class of believers that are in the first resurrection and a, another class in the second resurrection and um, if these comments we are not sincere if they are not coming from persons who are great lovers of god probably it will just be sufficient to let those comments pass without um, bothering oneself. Well, these are feelings from very good-minded people. Well, I, I begin by saying these distinctions are not mine. They are given in the Word of God. That's important. He says, but every man in his own order. If the order we are just one, then the language loses its meaning. If it says every man is own other, it means some will belong to one other, while others will not belong to that uh, other. Or perhaps even within the same other, there will be a stratification. Secondly, we do know from what we understand as happening in our churches and our local congregations that not every person in a given setting is demonstrating a, 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 a passion for God that is that is seeking to follow the Lord with us wherever he goes. Well, we know that dispositionally we can say that uh, God accepts all our efforts as consecrating ourselves wholly to him and that there's none following the Lord in the same full measure that Jesus uh, manifested in submitting himself to the Father. But be that as it may, we can still see clear distinctions between lifestyles that are embarrassment to the gospel and lifestyles that are um, evidences of, of knowing the whole purpose of God in redemption. Something certainly must be driving some people on in the way they live their lives, while others seem to be driven along another line, completely uh, opposite to the and dangling between these two polarities are a whole lot of believers. So you have three groups, those who yield their all to the Lord, those who only profess saving faith in Jesus Christ, and those who are in between. Now, in Philippians 3, in the last edition, we are really, we are seeing the life of Paul. And then, after talking about his passion from verse 7 to 14, see the things he had to say. He, he said, from what he said, it is clear that not only he, but a whole lot of other persons are following in that state. Then goes ahead to tell us of persons who are on the other extreme, who rather than even meriting a placement in any of the class of uh, resurrection, uh, uh, def definitely cutting destruction. And this is not said in any prideful manner. We cannot receive what we are not given. And the intention is intention in ministering this word and posting it on the website is to, is to inspire 
ourselves and others in this matter of uh, waiting for, for the Lord. Say ye yourself as they that wait for their master. And not to them that look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. And Paul says, setting um, the, the, that great reward he's expecting will be given to him on that day, the day of the unveiling of the sons of God, the time of the reward of God's servant. He says, it, this thing will be given not only to him, but unto all that love his uh, appearing. This is very important. So we'll be reading from verse 15, and as we go on, you'll find that there are some who by their very lifestyles are enemies of the gospel. And for those who yield their hearts to God to a measurable degree, saving faith alone will ensure that somebody is a member of the kingdom of God. And that is why the second class is said, they that are his at his coming. But I believe that we all have are made available to us by the grace of God. The grace of God is a teacher. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and to desire the Lord. The grace of God does not make one lazy. The grace of God does not make one a wardling. The grace of God is a mighty transforming power. And so we come to this edition, reading from uh, Philippians 3, chapter uh, chapter 3 and starting from verse 15 want to set out something very clearly in answer no matter at what point we are now we all can decide to be more given to the Lord Jesus Christ than we have, have been he say if you hear his voice harden not your heart there is always time to make amends and to move forward but only that time you can trust that you have the very moment the word of God reaches you. You can't throw it and say, maybe some, some one year after, two years after, you will give serious thought to being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Anyhow, come with me to Revelation, sorry, Philippians 3, beginning from verse 15. After saying he pressed towards the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, verse 14, verse 15 says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, the perfection here is not absolute perfection, but a disposition that is perfect towards God, loyal towards God, willing and desiring earnestly that the Lord will have the rule over them in all things. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded, that is, be driven by the same passion reported from verse 7 to 14 of Philippians 3. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Then, there is a great switch. It begins to talk about persons who are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, who by reason of the grace that have reached them, should live a morally pleasing life, are swinging to the other extreme. Verse 18. He says, for many walk, the original puts this in bracket, puts it in parentheses, Meaning it is distorting the flow of thought from verse 17. He would have gone straight to verse 20. But he needed to use verse 18 and 19 to, to, to touch on this, uh, on, on this prevailing condition among the greater many of the lost people. Jesus Christ himself said it, because iniquity shall abound and the world is like festering with iniquity like a saw festering with iniquity and wickedness you know and he says here verse 17 brethren be followers together of me and mark them who, which walk 
so as he have us for an example. May we provoke one another to love and uh, good works. But verse 80 says, For many work of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. That's the message of life. The passion with which Paul writes this shows that in pointing out this thing, he himself feel bruised. He had ministered among the Philippian Christians. They have such a wonderful record. He, he is speaking with such elated feeling all through the book of Philippians, a book of joy. But then he noticed some who are veering off at a tangent and begins to talk about them here. For many work of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is a destruction whose God is their belly whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things or carnal things or to be carnally minded is death to be spiritually minded is life and peace pride is excluded if the, if the cross has touched a soul it can only but have passion for those who are wayfaring men and women, fellow pilgrims in the journey of life, and we are to encourage one another to life. One thing is sure, nobody should say he has arrived too late to this kingdom. At this point you are hearing the word, you can still make it to the throne. And we are desiring, praying for you and praying for ourselves and desiring that the things we preach we should partake of and pride is excluded. The, the, they are those who will not even make it to any any of these classifications we are talking about. We have the choice. Grace will direct us to choose well, and God's glory will be made manifest in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. And of course, since we are reading Philippians 3, we we'll read verse 20 and, and 21 quickly and we'll jump to John 11, 25, 26. The, the, the thrust is this particular um, uh, series at this point is the resurrection of the dead as it relates to the first resurrection class. So we, we come to verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. This is said in contrast with those who mind earthly things. Those who mind earthly things can only get the things from the earth realm. And what comes from that earth realm is death. It, it says, mortify your members which are upon the earth. If we through the spirit to, to do mortify the deeds of the flesh, we shall live. But if they gain ascendancy and the things repented from, like a dog returning back to his uh, vomit, then it's, it's messy. But I do believe that all who come to this website and listen to this world by the grace of the God, who we desire to keep us focused, the Lord God will also help. This is our prayer. I want to ask you who are participating in this, um, listening to this teaching, to join us in praying for the lost people everywhere. The Spirit of God indicates that there will be a great harvest of men and women who love the Lord passionately. Verse 20, for our conversation, our replenishment, our citizenship, all our benefiting comes from the realm of the heavens. And if we be risen with Christ, let us mind the things that are in heaven. Anyhow, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the walking whereby is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The resurrection of the body, the granting unto the believer a change in his physical body, and the entrance into incorruption, as it is written, this corruptible shall put on incorruption is referenced here. And we are looking at that. The first resurrection hope is made firm 
as we reach out unto him to be the Lord over every area of our lives, both in developing us morally pleasing character and in building into us his attributes of power and wisdom. Amen? Amen. All right, so we come to John chapter 11. A very, very forceful statement is made by Jesus Christ. And I believe we will benefit from a consideration of this phrase. Of course, only an introduction is possible, but sufficient to establish something that should fire us up to seeking the Lord for the highest in his plan for us. John 11, 25, 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believers doubt this. Now, these two verses set out clearly two dispensations. A dispensation that started running from the time of the uh, early church and continues to the close of the age. It says of this, which is verse 25, He that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. If there is a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and a believing into him to a measurable extent, the word of God continues to say that saving faith, which is evidenced as being resident in an individual by living measurably well, by, by walking in sanctification, will be rewarded by participation in the kingdom of God. And so from the time of the early church to the end, the Lord's people have lived and at the point of death went to the grave with the hope of the resurrection in them. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, they that are asleep in Jesus have this hope that when the Lord returns, from heaven they will come with him so there is hope for it but then verse 26 introduces another dispensation that sets in at the time of the return of christ this scripture could not possibly have been understood by any in the years since the church age began up to the time of the end why because the truth revealed here could only possibly be seen, understood, and acted upon by those who are alive and remain of the church class in this last hour. It says, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That is a, 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 a distinction that sets it apart from this year. The never die yet talks about physical death. Of course, Paul also, inspired by the Lord Jesus Christ, has said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Here, we find the Lord Jesus saying, he is the resurrection and the life. So if an individual is expecting to know this experience, then definitely there must be a relating with the Lord Jesus Christ for this. For example, if Jesus is preached as healer, then we must submit to him as such. His testimony must be believed upon to experience what is already secured for us what is being offered for us in Christ Jesus. Amen? Or offered to us in Christ Jesus. Every believer in Christ Jesus is already healed of any condition 
The reality is there. The blessing is hanging over our heavens. But the day you take Jesus as your Lord and healer by acting on a revealed word and responding to the Lord in the way he, he communicates to you, you walk free from any ailment that has um, taken hold of you. Now, so in the same vein, he is the resurrection. The resurrection is not an, an event from the standpoint of the Lord. The resurrection is a person. He is the resurrection and the life. That's important. But turn to this 26 verse and see yet another key. He says, whosoever liveth and believeth shall never die. Notice the placement of the word liveth ahead of believeth. So it is not something for mental exertion. I believe I will not die. No, it is he that liveth and believeth that shall not die. Living comes before believing in things that pertain to our future inheritance. In relation to the things that Adam lost in the fall, we know the just shall have that thing recovered to him by faith. But faith does not take the preeminence when it comes to the matter of our future inheritance, which includes the resurrection of our human body. That change, that transfiguration, living comes before believing. And the things to believe can only be properly understood in the light of vital fellowship with God. The living is not talking about physical existence. It talks about living in a sight living in fellowship with him, committing yourself to him. Brethren, this is the trust of what the Lord is offering. By the prophetic word, we are waking to see that fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ is not a door routine, not something we just do just to keep, but there is a program unto them that look for him, what he's working out for us, we must be yielded to. He that liveth and believeth shall never die. Living comes before believing. Of course, we do say it at the end of the meetings and so that we just say, um, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my pilgrimage and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then say, truly, I shall not die, but live to declare the works of the Lord in the land of living. These are confessioners that are very strong and positive, but they don't take the lead. It is only as we live in him that we experience that awakening that enables us to take hold of God's word. The mere recitation can leave you experiencing a distraction from a proper focus from Christ until the time for another recitation. But he that liveth and believeth shall never die. The living is a continuous. We have to live in his sight. In the book of Hosea, it says, after so many process, it says, we shall live in his sight. And then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. It is in vital fellowship with the Lord that we gain those impartation. Of course, this is not difficult to see. Second Corinthians 3.18 tells us the law of our transfiguration. Uh, Moses' experience on the mount is a vivid reference to what is possible as we fellowship with him, with our God, something of his life comes upon us. The immortal presence kept over three million Jews protected and preserved through a period of 40 years. There is a winsomeness in the testimony of Christ. And if we are born by God's word to having vital fellowship with him, without loss of focus, he will speak things into our life that we need to hold on. Of course, there will be things in harmony with the written word. There will be things respecting the, 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 the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. It will not fall outside it. It will be something we can lay hold on and it keeps us going strong. And it, it becomes the, 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 the tonic for a, a, 
a constant spirit, for, for a focused spiritual life. He that liveth and believeth shall never die. Say, do you believe this? That belief will draw you into an open face fellowship with the Lord. And say, we are beholding the Lord with open face. Beholding the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one level of glory to another. And when you read that side by side with what we've dis discovered of Paul's passion in Philippians 3, we understand something of what the Lord is saying here. He that liveth and believeth shall never die. Let's say it to one another. He that liveth and believeth shall never die. We cannot find life outside of him. Christ in us is the hope of glory. We immersed in him is the glory itself. He that liveth and believeth shall never die. He that liveth and believeth shall never die. We trust that the breath of God is coming upon this world and people will break free from just plain church or nom just nominal Christian uh, um, lifestyle and know that so much is made available to us. The, the, the tone, the tenor of the message in Hebrews 4 1 says, you cannot say, ah, you are knowing this thing so late and you, 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 you can't uh, follow him to the point of making it to the throne. What the spirit of prophecy is indicating is that there are some who are unsaved now, unbeliever, who will get saved in the course of time and yet make it to the truth. You can begin to live a meaningful life for Christ in this last hour. Turn with me to Second uh, Corinthians chapter 3. It is the law of our transfiguration. He, 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 and it, it sets out very clearly that it is the, in the medium of the Christ revealed that we draw meal strong enough to give us that constant focus. So just that verse and another verse in Isaiah 25, verse 6, 7, and 8, all read in, in context uh, that will we'll be rounding this um, meditation with. Second Corinthians chapter 3. I would like you to to go through the upper verses, but we want to zero in to verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, the word is is in uh, italics, which means it's supplied to give it meaning. But the first there is where the spirit of the Lord has ascendancy and control over a man's life, there is liberating power experienced by the individual. Verse 80. But we all, and none excluded, we all, for as many as yield themselves to the Lord in this way, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. This beholding is a spiritual experience. As we fellowship with the Lord, it may begin mechanically. But as we, we labor in the spirit, pray in the spirit, and feasting on the word of life that is sent to us, there will be progress made. And we'll begin to have a worthy fellowship with the Lord, a dynamic, life-giving fellowship with the Lord. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The continuous transformation or transfiguration is God's plan for us, and it is obtained in fellowship with the Lord, living in His presence. Well, come quickly with me to Isaiah 28 and see the close connection between light given and life experience. And, and, and we are saying that the, the substance of the proclamation of the prophetic or the sound of the trumpet would be to communicate to us things that will enable us have this victory worked out for us 
by Christ Jesus. Isaiah 25, notice verse 6, what it says. Notice verse 8, which is quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. And then you come to an understanding that there's a close connection between what you eat and what you become. Our food determines what we shall be ultimately. Food was the problem that led man to fall. A proper food will lead man to life. He that liveth in his presence will have much to eat, much to, to, to provoke the spirit of faith to lay hold upon. It is he that liveth and believeth that shall never die. 25 verse 6. And in this mountain, the mountain of the house of the Lord, the sphere of God's rule and authority, the place of the unveiling of Christ among his people. In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering. The upper verses in Second Corinthians 3 tells us of covering be removed. Suddenly you come to an awareness that the salvation that is in Jesus Christ means much more than what you probably have thought of. And that grace can place us at the highest point if we yield our heart to him. He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast. In 2 Corinthians 3, there was a covering cast upon the people. And say, in the ministration of Christ, the revealed Christ, the veil is taken away. See, if a heart turns to the Lord, the, the veil is taken away. It is, it is in the ministration of the word of life. The veil is broken. As surely, certainly shall happen to so many that come into this website to share fellowship with us in this uh, series of teachings. Not only on the resurrection of the dead, there are other messages posted on that website. Each carries a life giving power. The word that he speaks to us, they are spirit and they are life. And it will destroy this matter in the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over our na all nations. And in the environment of doing these two things in verse 6 and 7, he says he will swallow up dead in victory. This is what Paul was saying when he, he, he closes his teaching on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, when he says, when this mortar or this corruption shall have put on a corruptible, and this mortar shall have put on immortality, there shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So the pain of apostolic inspiration lets us know that the subject matter being discussed in this Isaiah 25 has to do with the resurrection of the dead. The Lord bless you. Note it in your spirit. Living comes before believing. It is he that liveth and believeth that shall never die. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.